I will give us, Dave uh, indicated in the morning, give a short overview about uh, some clinical aspects of psychedelic research, and uh, I will summarize some of the uh, basic uh, assessments in the beginning, how we look at the psychological phenomena. Then I go a little bit into vision and uh, uh, the neural basis of uh, visual alterations, including hallucinations. And then I make a switch to uh, look at how do this uh, psychedelic uh, regulate or modulate uh, emotional processing. And from that step, I try to make a, a bridge to the uh, clinical application. And I will try to summarize where we are now. I will not speak a lot about uh, ketamine and MDMA because uh, maybe if we have time in the end, uh, for some who are interested, uh, I'll make some parallels to ketamine because it's clinically used. Uh, in the US and in Europe uh, for uh, inducing uh, sh uh, or for rapid activation of uh, mood in, in depression. So just to give you some background, I'm um, from Zurich. Uh, our institute is very nicely at the border of the lake. There's the town and you have the mountains. And uh, this was on the occasion uh, last uh, Christmas, for, uh, two years ago where we had uh, remodeled uh, the old main building. It's uh, <coughs> the so-called Burghölzli. And uh, the Burghölzli has about 500 beds. And now we fused with three other hospitals to become one huge, the, the largest clinic in, uh, in Switzerland. We had uh, two nice guys, uh, Bleuler, is the guy who invented the term uh, schizophrenia, and Carl Gustav Jung, who some of you may know as a deep psychologist. And the third child is LSD. LSD came into the clinic uh, very early in uh, 43, as of just after Hoffman had discovered methogene, hydrogen. Uh, in a series of uh, compounds he made, this was the 25th, as you may know. And he was running after compounds that modulate cardiovascular uh, regulation, particularly uh, in relation to uh, migraine and all these things. But the first uh, still market uh, compound was methogene, who is used after giving uh, birth to a child. Uh, it uh, reduces uh, the bleeding. So after that, a little later, there was Heimann in Lausanne. Then he went to Germany and Fischer. He Fischer went to uh, the US, became quite famous in the US, uh, was doing psychedelic research. Hyman started, uh, st studied the first time hydroxy LSD, which is an uh, ingredient in these compounds. Then in 58, uh, Hoffman was confronted uh, with the analysis of uh, magic mushrooms because nobody could find out what's the real compound in this uh, altered state inducing drugs. And so it came to Sandos. And, uh, then he came to the Burghölzli and to Kniers, it's another clinic nearby, and they did the first uh, study. Another child we had was Massimo from uh, fl Agaric Mushrooms, uh, was isolated by Oyster and studied by my first boss, Shui Langst, who is a well-known neuropsychopharmacologist. Then about in the 70s, uh, Leuner from Germany, who became quite famous in Europe. He did 25 years of LSD studies, psilocybin, a little bit of ketamine. Uh, founded with Hoffmann and Dietrich in Zurich at our institute, the European College for the Study of Consciousness. Unfortunately, it died out after 20 years. Uh, there's not much interest in the form it was because uh, Thorsten Passis is here. He knows these guys very well. He worked with Leuner and uh, but uh, it's hard sometimes to get uh, young people interested in the field. So we started with the neurobiology of psychedelics. I joined the hospital or the institute in 1990, and we started with a comparison study between psilocybin, ketamine, and amphetamine to tease out a theory that Dietrich had implied. He suggested that different inducers like mescaline, DMT, psilocybin or non-drugs uh, produce a common denominator. So we were interested in the beginning 
is there any evidence for that? And can we use modern technology? There was just the development of the first PET scanner in that time, and I worked originally at the PET Institute and not at the clinic, and uh, did basic brain science also in rats and mice and all that stuff. So in 1986, uh, I met Mark Geyer in uh, New York at the CIMP meeting, and he said, we have similar ideas. And he was just in the, uh, a, a co-founder with Dave Nichols of the Hefter Institute in the US. So after a few chats, we set up the institute at our institute. It's called the Hefter Zurich Center. And we got additional support from a Swiss foundation, which I uh, founded some years ago. And uh, this is now the Hefter Zurich Institute. We have a new clinic. It's called Clinic for psychiatry, psychotherapy, and psychosomatics. And we have a huge research uh, department, which I direct with Professor Seifertz. Uh, and within my own group, uh, the neuropsychopharmacology arm, we have the Hefter Center. The Hefter Center has access to every uh, specialist we need, and to the MRI Center, which is an integral part now, and the new PET Center and the EG Center. So, uh, we started as a one-man show. I started there, and after 20 years now, we are about 15 people, sometimes a little bit more, who do only uh, are dedicated to psychedelic research. This is uh, all the people. I cannot list up all the Hefter people like Dave and George Greer and Mark Geyer, who were the pusher that we have this wonderful enterprise today. So what are our questions at the institute, at the Hefter Institute. Uh, the basic thing was ph phenomenology. Can we, is there any uh, possibility to trace down these more, most complex uh, uh, multidimensional effects of psychedelics or all the states into a, a neurobiological based science? As, is there a common denominator of certain reaction types and so on? Are there predictors? We have not much ideas about how can we predict whether it's a good or a bad trip. Then we're looking at neural networks contributing to ego and self. I do not speak about this today. I will speak about next uh, Saturday about more uh, experiments we do to approach uh, how certain networks may uh, contribute or underlie the experience of a unified uh, perspective, like uh, the perspective from an ego or from a self, or what's going on if we experience self dissolution. Uh, another more easier uh, topic is the neural basis of illusions and hallucinations, because it's the best studied neural system in the brain. Most uh, neuroscientists started up with looking at vision, and the vision is the largest uh, module in the brain uh, we need for as humans. Then we're looking also at neuroreceptors and interactions. Uh, you learned a lot uh, this morning from Dave Nichols. Uh, we can't do all this in animals, uh, in humans. Uh, we need the animals for the details. We can do some receptor studies in humans, but not at that level what you learned this morning. So. Happily, we also have, since two years, an uh, animal research facility. It's very new, and we try to set up something with Dave Nichols and uh, Chris Price, who's running the animal facilities in our institute. And more recently, after doing a lot of background research, we try to provide more evidence or to understand how could psychedelic have an impact a clinical use, and for this we study, at the moment, uh, the neural basis of, of uh, emotion regulation uh, induced by these drugs. So as you know, uh, psilocybin, which I will talk today, has a very simple indole structure, which overlays with uh, LSD here, and uh, hits, as you heard, uh, or the 2A receptor, which may be one of the most uh, important. Then so-called second-order hallucinogens that are anesthetics like ketamine or PCP have been used in clinical practice, are still used in Europe, uh, particularly in Switzerland, in surgery for 
fast uh, little things. And uh, they are called second order uh, hallucinogens because they produce a kind of dissociative state. They are not really compa comparable with the serotonergic psychedelics, but there's quite an overlap uh, in terms of symptoms. So what did Dietrich uh, do 10 years at our institute? He was mostly interested in comparing this kind of drug-induced states with uh, meditation, relaxation techniques, sensory deprivation like hypnosis, samadhi tank, autogenic training, sensory stimulation. He was he worked uh, from different, uh, uh, he used different methods to tease out the common dimensions of these states. He was not interested to develop a specific rating scale for differentiating these uh, drugs and techniques, but he came then with the idea after doing, uh, studying a lot of people and doing a European study he used in a, in, a, in a plant study about 400 normals. They got different uh, inducers. And he proposed, based on the statistics, that they have a dimension he labeled oceanic boundlessness, openness, unity, uh, mystical experience. And there is an opposite pole, pole he labeled anxious ego dissolution with uh, prominent thought disorder, paranoid uh, processing, and uh, <coughs> loss of control. And then the other interesting dimension was a kind of visionary, or the visionary restructuralization, where people have more the uh, visual uh, experiences, but also uh, alterations in time and uh, space perception, and facilitated uh, memory to have better access to uh, all the memory traces is also all packed in this dimension. Then he found, after uh, another study, uh, individual or a separate dimension he called acoustic alterations up to uh, hearing voices sometimes, depending on the inducer. And then another was uh, a vigilance uh, uh, scale, which can go up or down. So it was more or less a five-dimensional psychological space he used to describe his experiences. Now, after doing many, many experiments, we have used this scale from Dietrich. He had developed, but we used a number of other scales to study these uh, subjective states. And you have to be aware it's a subjective experience. We try to have kind of psychometric measures to tease out uh, this experience across uh, subjects. Now, Eric Struthers uh, did his thesis in our lab. He's a psychologist and statistician, and he just published a book about uh, the tolerability assessment uh, prediction of psilocybin in youth states. You can get it through Amazon, and it's a lot of the basic things I'm going to tell you in the first half hour. So, Eric uh, started to a kind of criticize the scale of Dietrich using our data from the old double blind studies. Uh, there were about 330 psilocybin subjects. They had psilocybin placebo. They could also have had psilocybin plus uh, ketamine or another compound. But his idea was to look whether you have different drug inducers like MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin, all had placebo. Can we reproduce this five-dimensional space uh, Dietrich had put forward? So then he used all the other things like gender, education, doses. We did a number of studies where he used three different doses in the same subjects to get insight in those response effects. We used uh, the Dietrich's questionnaire, an older version, a new version. We used also a, mo a mood ratings case and so on. Um, we had different settings, EG settings, PET settings, and uh, neurophysiological settings. Now, to make the story short, Eric uh, produced from this, uh, or we could show that this five-dimensional structure of Dietrich's uh, rating instrument could be crunched down, in fact, to 11 sub-dimensions. And that gives us a much better picture. It's all a lot of statistics behind that modeling. So it's 
don't want to go into these technical things. It's uh, structural equation modeling and other things. He found basically an interesting uh, dimension like noetic consciousness, deeply felt positive mood, unity, disembodiment. And the interesting thing is you can have disembodiment like Dietrich, uh, this oceanic boundlessness, but quite independent sometimes of uh, emotion. It's not uh, in this kind of uh, rating, it not, does not depend if it's positive or negative experienced. Change meaning of percepts, synesthesia, visual alterations like elementary and complex hallucinations. And he also could show there is this acoustic alteration, cognitive disturbance and anxiety, which may mimic some of the psychotic symptoms uh, we see in, in schizophrenia. Here, just uh, a little bit of this uh, kind of uh, questions he used. I experienced a kind of awe. My experience had reached its effects. I had a feeling of being connected to a superior power, and so on. So when we use this uh, new scale to characterize things we have done and uh, things we do now, then we could really show uh, most of the dimensional alterations, like, for instance, here, uh, vivid imagery is quite dose-dependent. When you go on this axis, uh, you see low dose, high dose, medium dose, high dose. And uh, the space uh, depends, on the one hand, on the dose, on the other, on the chemistry. Here is uh, for ketamine, who pr produces much more impaired cognit uh, cognitive control and uh, more body dis disembodiment than psilocybin, but on the other hand, with the hallucinogens, uh, uh, the serotonergic, we have much more visual stuff. Quite a different uh, picture you get with MDMA, where you have blissful states, experience of unity, uh, altered meaning of percepts, and uh, a little bit of disembodiment, but almost no visual stuff. So it, it seems that the new scale is, is, is good to use in, uh, with other scales. Then we published recently about acute, subacute, and long-term subjective effects in about 220 subjects. You can look at these publications or you can ask me if you need any references. And uh, it's all in this new book. Uh, there's much more data uh, he added on. And also this kind shows that using the old uh, uh, scales from Dietrich, uh, the, it was nice having this main dimensions, but with the new scales, we can really better character characterize the, the state people are in, and also uh, it's scaled, uh, normalized the scale based on about uh, 500 subjects. It's not just the scoring and summing up of the individual scores. So I think we made some progress here. Interestingly, what we found uh, when we looked at the uh, in this meta-analysis, uh, we could hardly find really anxious ego dissolution. So hardly 8% uh, of our subjects, and we've done more than 1,000 experiments, uh, had a, a really dramatic bad trip. And we think it, this depends on the preparation phase. We use a lot of time to prepare subjects for all the experiences and all the technology we put on over them and uh, how we do the experiment. Here is another scale. It's a mood rating scale, which we have used during uh, the application of psychedelics. It's just for psilocybin with different doses. And just to show, uh, it's, it's really nice this, how you can uh, uh, kind of describe and, and catch these faces like uh, uh, inactivations during the trip, introversion, uh, emotional excitability, it goes up and down, sensitivity, and so on, heightened mood in the beginning of a trip. And psilocybin lasts about six hours, and this is uh, the first hour, the plot, or where you go into the trip and then how it goes down. So we did a lot of this kind of very basic description of the state. So also, but I do not ref um, go into the details, a uh, list of complaints we used 24 hours of the drug intake. And you see the most uh, important as a dose dependent was being fatigue, exhaustion, headache sometimes, but not dramatically, but almost no side effect if you know what you give and how much the dose is. 
a lot of uh, such, such data available now, how people uh, experienced this uh, experiments in our lab after six months and after one year, so-called follow-up data, and people found it very pleasant and so on, enriching, 60%, very pleasant. And we also looked at whether this has a long-lasting impact, and about 50% uh, made the point that it had also some changes in relationships in in relation to one's body, uh, awareness of the body, change of values, and so on. Uh, another point, not the long-term effects or the question, or is the question, can we predict uh, these kind of experiences? And Dietrich also did a study in uh, 82 uh, and uh, it was a three-year study with the Swiss National Science Foundation and made the claim that optimistic extroversion, heightened aesthetic sensibility, non-dogmatic religiosity had positive impact, also the activation of other factors. But this was the most important for the positive. It was hardly not really possible to, dis to, to have predicted from a psychological <coughs> level for the anxious ego dissolution. The, best predictor was emotional liability and rigid conventionality, people who are not very flexible. But what we added in this basic concept was first the dose. We found that the dose was the hardest predictor. Before, when we were surprised, we, we thought that the psychology and genetics and all that stuff has more impact. But based on that data we had, it was the, the first the dose and then all these things. Then uh, <coughs> we have done a study where we had uh, all studied about 260 subjects in the same way. And Eric Schutters also did all these statistics. He used uh, other scales like sensation-seeking scale, neuroticism scale, aggression scales, activity scale, sociability. We have more data but before we start this study. All these people get characterized absorption scale, and this was the most interesting, the, this is a scale that measures how could people get absorbed by uh, a task or by cognitive uh, performance or how they go into themselves. And this was the strongest uh, predictor in the end uh, before uh, neuroticism and all these things. You also can uh, <coughs> get these data because they're not so <coughs> thrilling here. In the end, uh, he came to a cross matrix to get predictors for the different uh, dimensions you can experience. And funny wise, again, in, in this larger double blind controlled sample, it was uh, the dose, and then it came to these uh, psychological dimensions uh, how people are open, uh, how they are emotionally stable or not. And uh, this were so these emotional basic matrix was the most important. So we use now a, a new rating scale from the Punk SEP. It's a emotion, behavioral emotion scientist in the US, very well known. And uh, he did a large studies in the US. And, whoops, that's better. Uh, we think that there is a kind of very basic emotional matrix people have, and it's, it's hunger, lo uh, hunger, lust, uh, basic uh, feelings uh, that may predict how people may react in these drugs. So, but what's new, and uh, made a remark this morning, we also have uh, sampled blood from all the subjects we had. We have now about blood samples from 500 subjects, and we started to analyze these data. We have published partially data, and just a new one will come out. We found that polymorphism in the 2A receptor, which contributes to the effect of psychedelics, and in the uh, COMPT polymorphism, CRMP, and also in the dopamine system, contribute to the response how people can uh, have reactions. The other thing is we have a kind of types. Uh, we found that even if we give people the drug several times, they respond each time a little bit different. Uh, 
uh, even you keep the dose and the milieu environment constant. And there are kind of three types. There were people that had uh, almost nothing like oceanic boundlessness. They had a lot of uh, more kind of uh, anxiety and problems that they could lose control. But it was not really a heart trip, uh, a bad trip, but this was the, the dimension that popped up in those, and uh, no, almost nothing visual. But the most uh, people have a, a mixture of uh, loss of ego boundaries, having a pleasant trip, not much anxiety, but a lot of visionary and visual effects. And there's other types that's almost only oceanic boundlessness, nothing with anxiety or vision. So in percentage, uh, there is uh, the most is mixed type, about 50% of the subjects. Then if you look a little bit closer after intensity, we found that uh, this uh, based on maximal score they could make in this, uh, when we measured their anxiety, it was very little. It was about 80%, uh, 8% and 40% of the people that said, oh, it, it, it's, it's most more anxious than we thought. And it was a predominant experience. They were less uh, in terms of intensity. It was not a traumatic thing, but people were more or less uh, not ready to go on the trip. So we can use a lot of other rating scale, like it's a very classical uh, psychopathological rating scale to look at psychopaths. And what you see here, the, the uh, positive syndrome in schizophrenia in first breaks gives a certain number. The psychedelics, we can dose dependently approach this. But from the content, from the experience, it doesn't say anything. Was it positive or negative? in terms of the experience. It's so-called positive syndrome means hallucinatory phenomena, thought disorder, and so on. So people use this to characterize the strips as a possible model of schizophrenia. What is the basic uh, or mainstream uh, model in schizophrenia research? They think that these positive symptoms, this uh, delusion from a thought disorder, perceptual alterations up to hallucinations may be based on a basic uh, filter system that is impaired for auditory or visual or cognitive gating in schizophrenia. And uh, the idea is that with such psychedelics, you change that filter and the brain gets overloaded by sensory input, as uh, Dave Nichols had uh, shown this morning. Another idea is, is a change of the signal-to-noise ratio. So the signal is not really properly detected, and it, the, the background noise pops up um, intermingles with the signal, and that leads to misinterpretation and thought disorder, etc. So can we measure these things? There are uh, models from animal research up to human research. They look at sensory gating. Sensory gating is this concept where people think you get sensory overloaded in psychedelic or psychotic states. You can use that in the animal. Uh, you give a white noise, background noise, you give a pulse, and you can measure a so-called startle amplitude, or in humans, the eye blink and the muscle, muscle tension. Here is EMG. We did that. We have compared uh, different drugs uh, in collaboration with Mark Gare in San Diego. It's also a Hefter member and founder of the Hefter Institute, and we wanted to compare the impact of psychedelics on this basic measure. When you give a pre-pulse immediately before the loud pulse, which gives you a startling uh, effect, uh, you reduce this uh, startle amplitude, and the reduction is called pre-pulse inhibition. It's a measure of the uh, uh, flexibility of the of how good you can modulate the uh, startle acoustic uh, evoked startle reflex. So we know that genetic uh, background or makeup has an impact of the startle and so on. We can do that in knockout mice that adds a lot uh, to understand the receptor that may be involved in these startle experiments. So what we found is that psilocybin reduces, in fact, the startle response. If you have healthy volunteers here, 
when you give them a certain free pulse pulse interval and you startle them, they can reduce the startle effect about 30%, use other parameters, about 50, then we change the uh, lead, uh, the pre-pulse pulse lead interval. It's a longer interval, it's 120 millisec, here is 30 sec. We change, uh, we play around with the intensity. We have a different kind of uh, startle modulation up to 60% and, and 40. Now if you give psilocybin, you see the, you get a reduction of the capacity to bring down the startle effect or the startle response. And it's just in the very short interval when we give the pre-pulse and pulse with a lead interval of 30 milliseconds. You cannot interfere with that. It's so automatic. If you have a pre-pulse and then the pulse, but pack, you startle. But with the longer interval where we have 120 milliseconds, it appears that psilocybin does not modulate that. And we think if people listen to the pre-pulse pulse we apply through the headphones, they get aware and uh, they get not disturbed and they can have an, it can have an impact that they are consciously experiences that. In normal subjects, they do not listen to this repulse pulse stuff, but on the psilocybin, you're quite open and you can realize that. So we think it's uh, confounded that, uh, or it's based on the intentional capacity that the prepulse is not reduced. But what the experiment shows is there is something in that for very short sensory gating processes, hallucinogens like uh, psilocybin can reduce the capacity to filter the external stimuli. And the reduction in the filter capacity really uh, correlates mathematically with the attention capacity uh, you can have on these uh, pulses. And here we working now very hard on the genetic on these things. Uh, as I said, some subject will see uh, some polymorphism in the in specific uh, 2A promoter genes uh, have marked reduction in the pre-pulse. And if we add the psilocybin, we have even a bigger reduction there. So we know a lot about, uh, I have no time to go in that details, about uh, the startle uh, neural networks, underlying neural networks. If we give a startle stimuli, it's processed through the cochlear nucleus, it goes to the pontine nucleus in the brainstem, it has an output to the motor neuron, you have an eye link. But we know that the whole system is top-down modulated through GABAergic systems coming from nucleus accumbens and the ventral pallidum. And this is not enough. If we make lesions or we knock out these, these scabiotic uh, interneurons or uh, we take, bring them down in, uh, with some vectors, uh, we, we disrupt the startle effect. But what is more interesting is that if we increase the dopamine system, we modulate this axis here, and we disrupt the startle pulse. What psychedelics may do, they activate frontal cortex and the hippocampus through activation of 2A receptors in these regions. We get a disruption on the one hand of the startle response, but also of the loop Dave had mentioned this morning, which we think is a neural network between frontal cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus, uh, to the primary sensory areas of the cortex, a kind of sensory information, a loop that processes external incoming information to the frontal cortex through the uh, back uh, arm or pathways through the basal ganglia. So you can basically modify these loops or this processing via increasing dopamine, activating serotonin system, or disrupting the glutamate system. There are many possibilities to interfere with such simple gating uh, experiments, but it also is an interesting model to explain. Psychedelics may work on this side of the loop. Ketamine certainly will disrupt the glutamatergic system, and uh, other compounds like amphetamines may push the dopamine system, but in the end, it's all interconnected, so it makes the things not easy. But it's a model where we can manipulate and uh, we can then tease out certain measures. 
what we have done here, maybe I go one back too fast. We use this startling uh, idea that we use as acoustic startle. I put people into the scanner. We gave them a startling pulse. We got the reaction. We gave the pre-pulse. It re reduces the startle reaction. We did it another time in three blocks. These were just uh, background noise. And we measured what's going on in the brain. And in fact, when we give a startling uh, pulse, we see some activations in brain stem, in, in systems we have inspected, certainly in the acoustic areas, but also in frontal areas and thalamus. And when we give the pre pulse, we find a modulation of the thalamic activation and some reduction in very uh, frontal limbic system and in orbitofrontal cortex, which is important for us experience of self and such things. But it's important. We just wanted to demonstrate we can uh, map out uh, what's going on in sensory gating processes and what's the impact then of uh, psychedelics. And psychedelics, in fact, modify uh, the uh, information processing between frontal cortex, striatum, and thalamus. Thalamus is altered in gating. So we did also a lot of studies to compare psilocybin with ketamine because ketamine has been used in psychedelic research a little bit in uh, treating of uh, therapy resistant patients and since about I would say four to five years it's a little comeback particularly with ketamine there were, had been done about I would say at the moment about 20 studies in the U.S. and about 10 to 15 in Europe. And in U Europe, it's quite increasing that people start to use ketamine at a uh, larger institution. And we have uh, set up a, a study between three countries and uh, using ketamine in patients because it's relatively easy. It's a, it's a drug that uh, can be used. Psilocybin is more difficult. And we also push a lot of the technological developments between, it's a study between Austria, uh, some parts in Ireland, uh, somebody who's two incidents in Germany and Switzerland. Now we want to set up the similar things uh, with psilocybin between Austria, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. And uh, going back to this old idea, here we found, it's quite old, it's, it's uh, 94, 96, we did this FDG study that basically mark out what's going on in the peak experiment, in the peak of the trip. It was measured about 70 minutes after psilocybin and about 6 to 70 minutes after ketamine infusion. What was the most interesting is this high up uh, prefrontal or frontal activation in the uh, dorsal anterior cingulum and somewhat <coughs> down here comparable between ketamine and psilocybin in the thalamus, there were some alterations, but they were opposite <coughs> between psilocybin and ketamine. And there was a, a lot of overlap, which uh, the details are not so relevant at the moment. But this was a starting point. We did a little bit more then, <coughs> and we tried to map out, can we link these alterations in neural activity to or map it to psychological experience. And we tried to come out with a few maps. One was this map for oceanic boundlessness, this frontal activation, single arm, frontal occipital activations, the activations <coughs> in the amygdala, the chrysocumbens, on the other hand, activation in the hippocampus. <coughs> when people were more in an anxious situation, they had a reduction in the orbital frontal cortex and an increase in the thalamus. They were the only two regions that really statistically gave a good signal, a good uh, covariance uh, that, that was statistically relevant. All the other brain areas dropped out. So we went then further on, teased out another dimension from Dietrich, the so-called visionary restructurization, which uh, measure illusionary uh, experiences and hallucinations. It should a little bit wobble, and it's just, it's nothing animated, it's just because the contrast between white and 
the dark, the dark side hits certain neurons that get uh, in an ambi uh, ambiguous state, <coughs> and you're not really sure is it dark, is how is the contrast at that edge, and that uh, teases your brain a little bit, and uh, he starts to think, oh, something is moving. Because you move your head, and then the contrast is always flipping around these neurons. <coughs> this is typically what people do when they have done an exper experiment. For instance, uh, EEG, they have time to draw or to listen to music or writing stories. And what we found is about 70% uh, elementary hallucinations, like Kluver found, tonal effects, or here a guy who was a biology student, uh, he had the experience going through a tunnel, seeing all the evolution and all these nice animals. Or here a fusion of, uh, was a medical student about uh, the lungs and uh, animals and very strange things, but nice. We like the, that people write down on what they do. <coughs> Sorry. So what, I, what you see here is, is a dose-response uh, assessment of elementary hallucination, placebo, two doses. The complex are not so tremendous like the elementary stuff. And the elementary stuff can be form, color, motion, all these lattices, these uh, spirals. This is very basic. As Dave pointed out from Kluver, already described, and these things we can measure very nicely. We can sum up scores, and uh, the complex things are even a little bit more complex. These are scenes and so on. Complex are memory recollection, new combinations of memory uh, influenced by sound, how is uh, landscape, scenes, people, animals, objects. So it's much, uh, it's also we can rate these things, but we cannot really measure in a physical sense. So hallucinations have dimensions. Uh, they have a locus where they occur. They have a vividness, and they have, have an agency. That's, uh, that's another categorization, how we can ask what they experience. So to have a better uh, separation across objects. Here are some nice drawings. What's very typical here is that people go into details, like here, every uh, thing they do with a pencil has some meaning. That's this, this change meaning flowers is a kind of birth rebirth, angel, death, uh, cycle, the guy is dying, is that that's the subject of the, uh, in the experiment. But it's also hooked up with some uh, Asian ideas about flowers, uh, grow up where you die, and so on. So a whole cycle of uh, archaic uh, psychological experiences, which I do not want to comment because we focus mostly on the biology. But nevertheless, it's, it's important to give people room and space. Even you do uh, high-tech uh, research, people uh, have this experience, and they have to have time to speak about it and to express uh, their feelings and so on. So we try to crunch down the experiments. Uh, in the beginning, we tried to do a lot, but now we do 15 to 20 minutes, then a pause about 15 minutes, and maybe a second experiment of 15 minutes, but that is what we do, and the rest people are completely free uh, using the time for themselves and talking with the sitter or dreaming and listening to music. It's very, uh, it's very important that you do the experiment in an optimal way. So now I want to come to a more complex uh, assessment. When we speak about hallucinations and visual alterations, we can measure these things uh, from a psychological point of view with writing skills. But when you go a little bit more in modern science, you don't believe that a stimulus comes into the brain and there is something like a, a mechanical thing, a receptor gets hit and you experience something. And for instance, I see you now because the energy goes through my eye and comes in here and uh, I'm processing uh, an arrow, it goes through the eye, it goes through the first primary optical pathway to the primary optic optical areas, then it goes to the frontal cortex, and then, oh, okay, I see a person. It's quite different what we know. There is a bottom-up processing, and the brain is built up of different modules. They are flexible, but mostly they do the same thing in all uh, the same persons. For instance, here are areas that tell you what you see, here are areas that tell you where 
I see you in a space, but you have to be to realize the information goes through these primary processing pathways, but get integrated as we understand it today, mostly everything in the frontal cortex to a whole. I see you as a whole, as a uh, integrated uh, uh, information, and you have a meaning. Signals that comes in through the eye go through archaic, basic emotional systems, called, for instance, the amygdala, goes in the anterior cingulate, and add balance and emotions to what I experience and what I see. So, and also this old system is very fast. People had first thought visual imp uh, input goes through the amygdala, and there's a kind of readiness here and activation of the frontal cortex. It goes to the areas that tease out the different features and integrate the features. But what we think that there's a kind of attention uh, or supervisory system that the frontal cortex constantly influences the processing, what's coming in. It's, con it's constantly filtered, evaluated. Is it new? Is it not new? Is it important? Should I better not ta pay attention? And the balance adds up to this uh, processing from the top down to the periphery, quasi. So there are, not, there are lots of new ideas that these processes are much faster than we thought before. It's not uh, going up to the Olympic system, getting teasing out the balance and uh, giving uh, meaning and so on. It's also very fast information uh, back uh, from the frontal cortex, also on these optical regions. So uh, this is one point, uh, it's what's going on in the brain, but there must also be a back information and in interaction with the environment. It's, you're not an isolated system. And when they talked this morning about how the receptors get hit by the 2A receptors by psychedelics, <coughs> I was thinking, how is the brain backfiring on this stimulation? Maybe that's a concept we don't understand. Tries to keep the whole thing in a homeostatic uh, balance. So, a little I'll give you a little bit details. Some areas here in the areas that process visual stimuli are just uh, analyzing: is the signal how is the contrast, or does it move motion areas, or is it the face? That's the most developed uh, neurons in in our brain. They react to a face, and it's, it's a very simple face, two eyes and, and the mouse. But it does add meaning to the evolution because uh, we, we need this kind of neurons. All the other neurons, they do not uh, detect so complex things. They detect edges, uh, is it straight or not, how is the contrast, does it move, and so on. But in the end, all this uh, processing, as I said, has to be integrated in the frontal cortex to a whole. And uh, now we can ask, what's going on with, with psychedelics? What do they do? Uh, to approach this, we think that the brain has a principle, and it's the principle of Gestalt. They are the Gestalt psychologists, that there must be some neurons or networks, it's not a neuron, but a, a network, an assembly, that looks at Gestalt. And that's the higher principle you look at features, you integrate the features of a table, edges, and so on, to a table, but you don't have neurons that detect the table. You build the, the table up, you construct the table. And so is it with other things that, uh, on the one hand, the construction is guided by making a gestalt, the gestalt that makes sense. If I look at the face, it's enough when I look at Dave's face, I see his mustache and one eye and a little bit of the nose, I know it's Dave. I don't need to see the whole Dave. It's enough to little bit features for the face. So it's similar with that. If you look at these uh, uh, figures, which uh, 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 they make sense if we turn them a little bit inwards, you see this triangle. And there are no lines here, but your brain is constructing these lines now. That's what we mean with object completion, making the principle of gestalt, you start to see a triangle. And it's very intriguing because there's nothing like a triangle. 
but shows that you construct the world now. Yes? Is anyone doing any work in uh, what nervous systems regulate this process so <coughs> people can just turn the, the optical illusion on and off? Yes, we try to understand this. Okay. We're working hard. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I just wanted to show you the same physical input. Because if you do biophysical e experiments, you need to be aware that this uh, control to this has to be the very same uh, contrast, uh, uh, black colors and white colors has to be very, by computer, if you take face, it has to be balanced. So one thing I want to show you, not to lose too much time on that then, is we wanted to know, does psilocybin modulate the first level of processing? Does it interfere with contrast, how the neurons detect contrast? Could that be an explanation? You give such figures, uh, they have a certain contrast, and they uh, get different uh, uh, contrast uh, figures. And uh, people have to detect whether it goes uh, rightward or leftward within this. Uh, you see here, leftward. And you, you play with the contrast. And people can't, the stationary can detect that normally. You make a lot of trials. And we do this with and without psilocybin. This dynamic contrast is things was moving and from left to right. And these neurons are the neurons that detect motion and are in a specific area. This is a little bit more complex, coherent motion. Uh, these dots go on, go on one side and one flips down suddenly. And normally, you have to overview the scene and you have to integrate it. Here you see it. They go all in the same direction, or one uh, goes down. Normally, there's no problem to, to oversee that. But it's another thing on psilocybin, because with psilocybin, you sometimes have s uh, the idea you see the things very macroscopic. You go very much into a detail, and you get lost here. And people say, oh, I see everything wonderful, better, like through a microscope. Uh, look at the flower, and it pops up, and it becomes really big. What, what happens is that. I have no explanation yet, but that you go into something, you focus on, and you lose the context. Yes? Are there cross-cultural differences between Western orientation and For this stuff? Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. It would be very interesting. Yeah. We have often students from abroad. Maybe we can look into the data. That's nice. Yeah, good idea. Uh, that's just to say attention tracking, giving an overview. Now, what is psilocybin doing? There's nothing doing on the very primary visual process, contrast detection. There was no effect uh, before the experiment in the peak uh, towards the end. We used as a blocker for blocking 2A receptors, catanthrine. So it seems not that something is going on here. You look at that sense uh, motion detection. Uh, contrast sensitivity that was uh, not stationary, but in motion. It was a little bit with catanserine, but it was not statistically significant. But what we found is that psilocybin, in a specific way, modifies an area that's responsible for motion detection. And that could explain that people see things going around and going with the music and so Just Just a possible explanation. Because the experiment does not say where it is. Is it going on in the brain? It just says, hello, something is wrong with the few neurons that are here for motion detection, or they get confused, and so on. So interestingly, it's more a pharmacological thing. We can reverse that with a 2A antagonist. So that adds, again, to the idea that the 2A receptor is important. So now let's go on a little bit more complex visual process. What you see on the right side is the so-called um, perceptual rivalry. Look at the vase, you don't look at the face. Look at the face, you don't look at the vase. So try to see both equivalent, balanced, on the same time. It's not easy. But here you have another tricky so-called perceptual rivalry. You see this neck cube, it pops up, it pops in. Try to keep it stable. So it's not so easy. Your consciousness is doing something with you, and you have not so much free will like you would like to have. So it pops up, goes down. And this popping up and down or back and forth, everybody has his cycle. Maybe it's one second, you 1.2 second, the other three second. 
It's cost between half a sec to about 2.5 secs. Everybody is somewhere in this going back and forth. Now, there's another much more complex stuff is this figure here. And try to relax and to look at it, and maybe it's doing something. I don't know. Maybe somebody sees something. I don't say what I ex we should expect. It's a manipulation of the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what has an impact. <laughs> you see, uh, maybe something turning, a ball going in some direction. And is it always the same? Huh? Really? Can you clap any change? I would like to hear. Oh. You could answer. Yes. Can you make us two people? I need two people who clap. When it, no, no, when it turns <laughs> for you in your world, not in my one. No? Again? Always. Tuck, tuck. And you? There you see. Everybody has his rhythm. The same physical input. Everybody sees absolutely the same. The software does not animate something that turns. It's just you see the point that it's here or not here. It's just time, frequency stuff. But everybody sees it's going up like this or like this. But the cycle, everybody has his own cycle because he has his own brain and he constructs this reality. It's just a very simple uh, experiment where we can show that everybody lives in his own world, but nevertheless, we can understand that there's a three-dimensional system we walk through and we understand we meet at the same point. Yes? So there are also people who don't see it changing? Rarely, very rarely, yes. But this experiment is taken as uh, one of the few experiments people think somehow consciousness comes into play because you have to be aware of it consciousness, also awareness is not really consciousness, but uh, that you have not so much access to this. It's done automatically. So if we do it more complex, we give a subject a goggle, and it has a crystal liqu a liquid crystal shutters, and they are open. They're open on the right eye, uh, vertical, and here horizontal. Also, they have and when you look through, the, through these shutters, I see you quite normally, like you're here. But when I use this kind of grid in a projector, this eye sees only the horizontal and this the vertical grid because it goes up like this. It depends on the frequency, how fast I open the shutters. If I do it very, very fast, your brain gets uh, a little bit weird and starts to decide, oh, I see only this world or this world. It's like with the turning ball. But this how we uh, black the brain and want to, to bring him, the brain into a state. And the consciousness uh, makes this decision in a way automatically. So this is the frequency distribution, uh, how these changes are. This is a second, and here's about 1.5 second. Of Everybody has his his uh, kind of fingerprint, has his uh, spectrum, how fast uh, he changes. So we wanted to know what the psilocybin doing at different doses. And this is a medium dose. And this is a normal, a normal subject. He has his uh, switches in that experiment, his normal distribution of his switches or mean to uh, second. Sometimes he switches a little slower and a little faster, but the mean is that. And uh, this is profile for vertical and horizontal worlds. Now we give psilocybin, and over the, it goes six hours, over the first one and a half hour, and it's the peak, it's not much going on. And people come more in the peak effects, and psilocybin starts to modulate the switches. And you see, uh, oh, they go over the thing, they come more and more in a very regular oscillation. So psychedelic can bring your brain in a, in a constant oscillation. That's, that's a new thing. So it's the data, we don't need this. So here again, a normal 
uh, placebo, just a single case, and how the subject comes, gets tuned in in his cycling. So that gives us the idea that psychedelics also interfere with the electric activity and how consciousness is now tacted or guided or these things. So, uh, we had a very nice girl from Australia who did all these experiments as a postdoc in the Hefsher Institute, and she went then back to Australia and, uh, and to, uh, to Harvard. Uh, she went then after our uh, education in Zurich, she went to Harvard, and she came back and worked with this monk because we thought that in meditation people also have more power on their consciousness than we have. And this were very nice. It was in India. They were laughing about the experiment, and we explained them. We would like you to uh, take this Google and try to influence your consciousness and focus and relax. So, okay, we do that, and we, we have published that. And you see, they do the same like psilocybin does, but they train a little bit their brain, and they can also can very, very focus and um, come into a specific cycle. So. This was, it's, it's no new data, it's about five years old, but nevertheless I want to show you there's some link between drug-induced uh, psychedelic states, people are not trained to work with their mind in that way like these nice people here, but they do it will, by will and uh, it's interesting to follow this deeper. It's also one of our intentions to do a little bit be biophysics with long-term meditators a bit, little bit more extensive, more complex. So, another approach is we have showed you a few uh, experiments where we showed that these uh, neurons for motion detection get weird. So this may contribute to the idea that things turn around. The whole system gets into a certain cycle. And if you do a little bit uh, other kind of imaging like blood flow measures or here, this was an FDG study. We got correlations. We were looking for areas that may be less or more active <coughs> with the intensity. The whole visual experience uh, happens. And we found uh, negative and positive correlations, frontal activations, and rather some deactivations in visual systems that may contribute uh, to these missionary experiences. Here, the red are areas that, for instance, give us information where is something, what is it, what is it, get a little bit overactivated, more in the frontal cortex, and some visual pathway get relatively deactivated. So, now if you all do all this imaging, you have to image, uh, maybe there are some images here, uh, with the uh, old pet with the FDG, you have to measure 60 minutes, it's quite long, but you get a good measure of what's going on in the nerves, in the cells. If you use water label pet, you have to measure one minute, and then you can ask people what have you experienced, another minute you can ask, and so on. But when you go to these uh, more EEG-like things, uh, where you look at brain electric activity, you can measure uh, the millisecond range really fast. And you can look at the top of the, a little bit into the depth, but mostly at the top and, and the connectivity between the brain areas, what's going on, and look a little bit into the brain, but not really down in the middle, like with all the <coughs> fMRIs and uh, uh, PET systems. But nevertheless, it's fast. And what we wanted to try to understand is this cycling. What's psychedelics doing on synchronization, for instance? Or different brain areas out of, uh, do they, are they separated? Are they not connected? Or are they better connected with psychedelics? Or are there clusters of uh, areas that work very closely together? And there are two different things you can do. You can just look at people in resting states, hooked up with 120 electrodes. And you can look at the topography. And you can look at uh, how this, uh, maybe this, this should work here. This is not real time, but this is what's going on. Red and blue are electrical deep holes. Uh, it's a little slowed down. Here you see millisecond. This is, the whole thing is not a second. 
your brain is always working, and, and the color changes is an indicator how the areas uh, on the surface and in the uh, deeper centers, how they work together, how the electricity is exchanged. And here you see, if you have 120 or the 200 electrodes, you see on the each electrode you see how the electricity is going on. This is you can do that in the resting state. You can look at clusters, how areas work together. You can look over time, but you can also give a stimulus. For instance, you show a picture. You sit in front of a screen. You hooked up with the electrodes, and you look. The computer gives you a nice face to look at, or a sad face, or we speak about faces because faces are good stimuli. And then you measure the time on the each electrode and the change in uh, voltage in electric activity. And this is the signature for a s evoked response, a stimulus evoked response. So you can do that with all the electrodes. You use a lot of mathematics. And you calculate and you find out where is the picture you look at during that stimulation uh, process. And you get three-dimensional pictures through mathematical tricks. Even you measure at the surface. So that's the principle. And you, we have a sampling rate of 1.3 kilohertz. That means at least a 1,000 pictures of the brain per second. So we have a lot of information. You need big computers to reconstruct all these things. Oops, we have to go on. So just here again, uh, this is a uh, time, this is voltage, and you can measure over the brain this information here, resting state, and you can look at very complex interactions between areas. We call that, uh, simplify that now, connectivity, in phase, not in phase, and you can give stimuli, and the stimuli that have to be processed can be phase locked or can synchronize. Different areas can become synchronized and work together. These things you can study with a lot of mathematical uh, algorithms, but I don't want to go into that. You have evoked power or induced power. The brain does something, does uh, his own uh, coordination across areas, and so on. There are bands in terms of frequency, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma bands. That's just how we sort out the, the frequency. Frequency one, uh, one to four hertz, four to eight, just convention. So we can look at these effects of, of psychedelics. Now, I showed you this first experiment, where is a Gestalt experiment, and we know from neuroanatomy, goes through the eyes, information comes to the brain, and has to go to the prefrontal cortex. It's a physical, simple stimulus. And what is psychedelics doing? Here you have the time. Oops. Here you have the response. After 100 millisec, it goes up, and then it goes down, and it goes up further on. 300 millisec. It's not a second. And then we gave the control figure. People sit. They have to say what they see. Left or right button press means I saw the triangle. I don't see it yet. I cannot see it. But if you overlay the two figures, you see that the triangle, at a certain time step after 170 millisec, produces a, a difference in, in, in strength. And but also here, it's just the time. You see, just over time, here is not nothing going on. But here, uh, here in this processing is something different between the tr seeing a triangle or not seeing a triangle between these two figures. Oops. I think you got it. So what we know is first is contrast. Here after. 100 millisec or 50 millisec when the signal comes into the brain is the contrast detection. And we thought nothing is going on behaviorally. Something in the construction of the, uh, of the triangle is going on. Oops. So we have uh, given different doses of psilocybin, low, high dose, placebo controlled, 
And what we found is, in fact, through uh, tricks, uh, psilocybin reduces the difference between thin and triangle, not thin and triangle. And this is a specific process in different brain areas from the visual system, how we expect it, more on the right than in the left side. And we think uh, because the signal is not extracted as normal, so the frontal cortex can fill in and can start to hallucinate. Because what we found is that with the reduction of detecting the triangle, uh, the brain comes into another cycle and fills in because it does not extract the, the information as normal. And this is what you see here, this uh, reconstructed of all these signals, how the brain areas get activated, deactivated, and how the signal goes from the occipital cortex to the frontal cortex. And this extraction and this construction process is reduced with psilocybin compared to the normal state, but allows then the frontal cortex to produce his own image. And the less the subject could detect the triangle, the more he had his own stories in his head. It shows here. This is the reduction of the signal detection and processing, the more he hallucinated, because the brain has to make sense of the stimulus. If the stimulus cannot really be processed as normal, you fill it in, you complete it. And that's exactly what happened. We showed that now a third time, and we are quite sure that this is uh, a two-way receptor-mediated process. We could not block it with the exception of catanserine. This is the only blocker that could normalize this phenomenon. So the idea is the brain cannot really process the signal as normal. It's less maybe signal-to-noise extraction. It has to do something. It, it gets stimulated the brain and has to make sense of it. And that's what we constantly do also with more complex things. When you go through a room and you see a rope in the dark, you can think it's a snake because you see it's just like a, a rope. Oh, maybe a snake. But it's a very similar story. So the brain has not enough food and uh, it starts to fill in. So there's a lot of theory. We're working now on this frontal top-down to the visual system. Now we do a study to tease out this much better. So we just got the first evidence, but we can go on. We can do here uh, something very interesting. If you have faces, you look just at faces, uh, and the face may be arrogant or panicked or uh, uh, can express fear you normally can detect that from the eyes. And that was also a question. Or you give words, uh, nice words, uh, negative words, that also are stimuli from different complexity. Words are stimuli on the cognitive level. Faces are very basic emotional stimuli. There were another questions we had. Does psilocybin improve the social interaction? If I look at you, I get the impression, now oh, you're here, you're nice, you like me, you don't like me. I all read that out of what, uh, how I interpret what I see. It's because of reading uh, out of faces. And what was very interesting is oops, that, I'll just show you after then, the results, that psilocybin markedly modulates these two uh, social interactions. So, I come to the last, it's the most complex data we have now. Here you give a stimulus, here is your brain state you are in, and here is the response. It's very simplified, 170 millisec. Here is another electrode, and here is right, middle, left in the visual system. What I want to show here is something that is much more complex than we thought. When you get all these stimuli, you respond to this visual stimulus because it's a physical stimulus. But it depends markedly on what level you are, on what arousal level. There's the alpha oscillation. The pre-stimulus activity also has a marked influence how good you take out the information, how is it processed, how is it uh, experienced. What you see here on the normal conditions, uh, it, it's markedly changed with psilocybin that uh, the pre-stimulus activity 
determines how you respond. And now we're looking at each subject, trial for trial, how the brain operates with the information it gets in. And it looks like that on the psilocybin, the brain does not so much, uh, in these different states, look at the outer world. It's more a processing of the inner world, what you can uh, use the information out of your memory, out of how you are in your thinking process. But it does not process the normal external stimuli in the uh, normal way, as in, in normal waking states. So what's behind the whole story is that we think that this area that should extract information are hyperactive in the visual system, they're excited, and you cannot excite these areas in addition with the stimulus enough that you have a full information processing, and that's because the level is, is already up, and if you're up, it's kind of ceiling effect. You cannot go up and up and up and put stimuli on that. So that makes the whole psychophysical uh, understanding of the, how the brain works more complex. On the one hand, it depends on the state you are in. This also explains why do subjects react differently with the same dose? Why does the same subject react the second time also different or the first time? It's not just the environment, the certain setting, people say it's also particularly the level you are in when you go into the experiment. And the other is a third compound which, uh, or a third uh, important effect is also the interaction you have with the environment has impact how you experience something. So I would like to stop here and go on later a little bit with this emotional stuff. Okay?